Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's live stream. Happy Wednesday to you. I'm really delighted today to have a guest speaker, an expert guest speaker in Scott Edgington from Qualified Financial Services. Scott is um, a veteran in the, in the community of financial services, been helping um, not only um, uh, uh, agencies, but also advisors, developing advisors, coaching them, training them, giving them great education. Um, he's got a weekly blog, um, does a lot of live stream events. I know we're all a little um, tired of these events, but welcome, Scott. I'm looking forward to hearing uh, from you all this great information about when is the best time to take CPP payments. Great. Well, thank you, David. It's a pleasure to be here today, and uh, thanks to everyone that's joining in. Um, it's a great uh, question because it's one of those questions that uh, – unfortunately usually gets answered with it depends. So what I thought we could do today, David, is go through just the basics of how uh, CPP and OAS work. And then we can maybe dive into the when question. And I think it's the, to answer that question, it's more, it's specific to an individual situ personal situation, more so than a blanket rule. Right, because there's um, among my clients and whenever I'm talking to individuals and they're just saying, hey, when's the best time? I get, you know, a lot of people confused about when they want or when they think they should um, take their CPP, especially mm -hmm. in situations when um, couples have a, a, a wide uh, age gap. So one is going to retire five, six, seven years ahead of the other and they're wondering, you know, should I take mine ahead? Should I defer? Like, what is the best thing to do? And so I'm really looking forward to getting uh, okay. to that question. So why don't we begin with your first slide? Here we go. Okay, so just uh, as I said, we'll do a quick review. Um, CPP is a contributory plan, which means uh, we contribute as employees, perhaps, or and our employer contributes, it's a 50-50 split, and it usually is about 10% um, in gross terms of what someone makes up to a particular limit, which I think this year is about $59,000. So $59,000, $5,800 would be what someone would contribute in a year. And some of you that uh, perhaps uh, are earning more than that would notice that in July or August or so, your CPP premium stop, and that's because you've hit the threshold. So it's very much like a company pension plan, except it's run by the government. And if it was a company bench, uh, pension plan, we would say that it's a defined benefit pension plan because we know in advance, uh, assuming the contributions arrive, what someone will receive regardless of the underlying performance of the investments that the Canada Pension Plan Investment Board hold. Uh, OAS is a little bit different. That's old age uh, security. That is actually funded by tax dollars. And that, um, we'll get into the numbers in a second, but that's another part of kind of the retirement safety net that the government has in place for this. And OAS certainly, if someone had never worked uh, for whatever reason, they would still be eligible for OAS uh, based on some residency rules. Okay, so David, perhaps we can go to the next slide. Just a quick uh, re refresher here again. This year, uh, someone who turned 65 uh, in 2021, and they had uh, been able to contribute the most for the longest period of time, and I'll get into that a little bit, would receive about $1,200 a month, and it's a fully indexed benefit. It gets indexed every year with uh, the Consumer Price Index. Um, and similarly, someone that was 65 this year would start their OAS at 618 under uh, the right conditions. And actually the conditions are very similar. To get the maximum OAS, someone needs to have been a resident or a taxpayer in Canada for 40 years. And similarly with CPP, it's a contributor for 40 years in a plus contributing the most each year. And, uh, Services Canada or CRA do have some rules where they can throw out some bad years if perhaps someone took some time off to go back to school or to uh, be with a newborn child or something like that. They will back out some uh, low income years. But my rule of thumb is 40 years. And if someone, say, is came to Canada and worked here for uh, like at age 35 and worked for 30 years until they were 65, they could expect to get three quarters of the benefits provided uh, 
for CPP anyways, that they contributed the most uh, over those years. There's yeah. something you may see from time to time. That's okay, we can go ahead. Um, uh, what I wanted to say to you yeah. was, um, but people can find out in advance. Yes, yeah. Um, I have to say that uh, I reached that age uh, last year and uh, I got a letter from Services Canada telling me what um, I would be receiving when I turned 65. And if you ever want to know, of course, you can log into uh, your personal account at Services Canada and see your CPP information, see your RSP room, see your TFSA room, all those sorts of things. I would encourage people actually to, uh, to establish that account and uh, unlike me, remember what the password is. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you, that is a that is. I have to say one thing about logging into um, that website is you really do need to think in advance because it's going to be a two step process to get in there. They're going to send yeah. you your uh, your codes um, after you uh, request. Yeah, you get a letter in the mail, and unfortunately, I think there was a breach earlier, maybe two months ago. And uh, everyone now has to re-register. Oh my goodness! Wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, sort of getting to the topic at hand here, um, when to start our CPP? And it's a, as I said, it's kind of a question similar to how long is a piece of string. But uh, here's the way it works: if someone were to start early, for every month before age 65, someone begins their CPP the benefit that they're entitled to receive goes down by 0.6%. And the earliest age that someone could begin their CPP is age 60. So that would be 60 months early. We reduce it by 0.6% per month. So someone starting right at age 60 would have a 36% reduction in their CPP benefit that they were eligible for at age 65. So let's just say someone uh, qualified for $1,000 a month with CPP, they started at 60, they get $640, 36% less than $1,000, okay? And we can move along here, David. Uh, the next one is, what about deferring? Each month that CPP is deferred, 0.7% is added to the benefit. So again, using the outer limits, the longest, by the way, you can defer it is age 70, and the youngest you can start it is 60. You can't, it's within those 10 years. But if someone were to defer their CPP until age 70, they would have 60 months times 0.7, which would be a 42% increase in the benefit. Um, so a thousand dollar person at 65 would get 400 or $1,420 if they waited until they were 70. Okay, it's a very straightforward formula, um, but the, it, it's, I have to say we'll get to it, some reasons or some methods to determining when to start, but it is going from 1,000 to 1,420, that's a material amount of uh, extra money each month. In addition, remember that the benefit is indexed, so now a $1,420 benefit is going to be indexed as well at 1 or 2% or whatever the CPI is. Okay, thanks, David. So the the the, the big uh, distinction here is it's quite a bit of money mm -hmm. uh, taking it early versus deferring and taking it to the oldest age of age seventy. Yeah, it's a significant amount of uh, monthly income for that uh, senior to have. Most definitely, yeah, absolutely. Like it adds up. You know, I don't have my calculator in front of me, but what would that be? Uh, Fourteen hundred dollars a month is what about sixteen thousand dollars a year? So that's over, if someone lives 20 years, that's $320,000 yeah. uh, extra income. So it, these are not uh, small figures. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. Now, OAS, uh, for the record, can also be deferred, but it can only be deferred forward. You can't start OAS early, so to speak. So the earliest age to start OAS is 65. But for each month that someone waits to start their OAS, there's a 0.6% increase in the benefit. So um, numbers are lots of numbers whirling around here, but someone that were to wait until 70 would have 36% more uh, than their whatever the 618 or so that's available today. So that's another, as David was saying there, 
it, it's a significant amount of money. A third of $600 is another $200 a month in OAS yeah. payments. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a meaningful number. Okay. Now, this is one of the things to contemplate actually about starting early your CPP. Um, OAS is clawed back. And I think I popped the number in there. So if someone that has net income in excess of $79,000, uh, for every dollar in excess of that, 15 cents of their OAS will be clawed back. And if we were to do the math, I believe right now, if someone has $128,000 or so of net income, all of their OAS is gonna be clawed back. It's a bit of a complicated procedure because it's not based on calendar years. They look between June one year and July the next year and then apply the clawback in the future. And the reason they do this is that they want people to file their taxes by the end of April. And then all those numbers go into the machine and get churned around and uh, Services Canada then says, well, for example, Scott, you made $80,000. So we're gonna claw back a little bit of your future OAS. So this may be a reason um, to start CPP early to get a lower CPP payment in order to avoid an OAS clawback in the future. It's a subtle thing, but it is a reason to start early. Um, and I'll get into some more reasons, but I see you've just come in here. But I, I, yeah, so that's, we're gonna, I know, explore this in more detail. Yeah. That's one of the, the key points here is, can we touch a little bit on income? Because there's a lot of people that sure. seem to think that um, different kinds of income don't um, affect your clawback. Okay, sure, I'd be glad to go through that. Um, there's really sort of income we make at work and by and large income we make from investing. Right. So for every dollar you make at work, your net income goes up by a dollar. Uh, for every dollar in interest income, so if someone owns a GIC or something, that adds a dollar for dollar. If someone is receiving dividends from a stock, let's say, that actually increases your income by about a dollar thirty. So if you get a dollar of dividends, your net income goes up by a dollar thirty. It's kind of who may or may not be familiar with the dividend tax credit, but the tax credit is applied after the gross up of the dividend. So grossed up dividends are included in net income. And the last source of course is uh, capital gains. And right now, I say right now, because I think our government's thinking about changing it, but right now uh, 50 cents of every dollar of capital gains is included in net income. So one thing I know David does is tries to make sure that uh, his clients have the most efficient net income, not trying to reduce the amount of net income to avoid taxes, but let's get our net income from capital gains. Let's, uh, for another uh, thing that makes no dent on net income is withdrawals from a TFSA because they're tax free and you don't include them in, in the income. So the idea, um, and we say this all the time and when we help clients is that it's all about taxation. It's trying to get the most after tax dollars into people's hands to use in retirement. Um, while it's, I think it's a nice intellectual endeavor to talk about the investments and how they're growing and what the economy's doing and what, uh, goodness knows what else is going on the stock market and things. If you can, uh, successfully manage your tax situation, it will provide you with a lot more income than picking the next big stock or big fund. It's the, one of the few things that we can directly control and it is the most important thing to manage. So what we're trying to do is get people's net income to the, rep the net income the re that's reported as low as reasonably possible in an effort to minimize OAS clawbacks, for example, or just minimize taxes in general. So that would mean, so when you're, so I, I wanna, obviously people who understand income, they're gonna get this, but I just wanna be sure that everyone mm -hmm. that watches this uh, live or on the replay understands income. Income also includes any way that you um, receive money that you have to pay tax on. So for instance, rental property income. Most that definitely, yeah. Consider, so many people, you know, Scott, over the last, Deck more than a decade now have been using the, their equity in their home because their home values have gone up so dramatically and they go out and buy condos or just rental properties mm -hmm. and income is now in their hands it's taxable so if they're thinking when they're retired that they have these rental properties that is added to their tax most definitely 
Yep, most definitely. And uh, CPP and OAS, as a matter of fact, <laughs> get yeah. counted. The only thing you do is when you do the clawback calculation, you strip out the OAS, but that's yeah, that's it. But it's a significant thing to consider when, sure. when people are thinking, because I know a lot of people think, oh, I've, I've retired, I'm not working anymore, but they have these passive income streams that are still taxable as well, and that gets added to um, the total. Yeah, and uh, you know, you bring me on to, don't want to get too far off topic here, but that's another thing that's available for couples is income splitting. Right. And any, you know, rental income perhaps could be split, you know, an accountant could help a couple make sure that that gets divided up and uh, all pension income can be split, including CPP. So if people are in their RIF and LIF years, that money can be split. Or if they have a company pension, that money can be split. And what I notice is once the splitting takes place of income, that the average tax rate in the household goes down dramatically. Exactly. Yeah. Our um, our tax system is definitely tilted for helping retired people, because I you could be in the average of a forty percent tax bracket when working, and then once people retire, I've seen it dip to twenty and fifteen percent, and mainly because of income splitting. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So. Okay. So the magic question here: When should I yeah. start? Um, <laughs> a lot of preamble to get here, but it's good to know the background, I think. Um, yeah. To me, the, the number one decider is, does a person need the income? And if they do, just start it. Uh, case closed. There's no really way uh, away from that one. The next thing to contemplate Sorry, is... So, so the, uh, I'm just going to pause you there on that sure. one thing. Does the person need the income? So really, this gets down to financial planning with your advisor. Most definitely, yeah. Because a lot of people focus when you're doing reviews with clients, none of my clients, because I'm, I'm always on top of uh, this particular question, but a lot of people focus on rate of return. What kind of rate of return am I getting? And they're so, yes. so uh, centered on, I want this rate of return. And really, that's such a small part of the total planning process. It's really about how much income are you going to receive at specific times in your life? Is it going to be mm -hmm. adequate enough mm -hmm. to sustain your lifestyle? So. When somebody decides to pull the trigger and retire, and they, they're they thinking, I'm going to defer CPP, I'm going to defer my my uh, flipping my RSP to a RIF, the question is, what do you do from age, let's say, if they retired at 65, what do you do from age 65 to 71 when your RIF payments start? Yeah. So when you say, does the person need income, from where are they going to receive this money? So isn't that, that's what you're really saying is, where is the source of money coming for at retirement? Because the, they need to replace the re, their paycheck right away. Yeah, exactly. And if someone hadn't uh, per, doesn't have a, perhaps a big investment portfolio, they may need to start their CPP uh, for because they need the income, as I say. There, there's that. There's that gap in terms of uh, yeah. income, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So the next thing to contemplate uh, after do you, does someone need the income is, is there longevity in the family? And uh, people are living a long time now. Um, I, the little anecdote that I've shared uh, many times is that there was a point in time where if someone was turning 100 in Canada, you could contact the Queen's office and the Queen would prepare a letter and send it, or I don't think the Queen would prepare it, but one of her associates would prepare it and they would send it to the person wishing them a happy 100th birthday. They actually had to stop that because they were overwhelmed with the number of people making the request. And if I have memory serves, about 10,000 people are over the age of 100 in Canada at the moment. And that number is going to keep going up. Um, so if there is longevity in someone's family or in your family or someone's family of older, you know, parents and aunts and uncles, that may be an indication to maybe defer starting because you can get uh, a lot more money for a lot longer if there's longevity in your family. On the flip side of that, if uh, there's an unfortunate situation where someone has um, shortened life expectancy, they may want to start their CPP right away in order to get the benefits started and get as much of it as possible while they're around. Right. So that's something to contemplate. And it's also... Um, well, I didn't put it on, uh, maybe I captured in the last bullet here, but there's nothing wrong with one spouse starting it and the other one waiting as well. You don't, they don't have to be started at the same time. 
Uh, CPP does have a survivor's benefit. So a surviving spouse will receive the survivor's benefit, which is calculated based on the deceased's uh, CPP and, and includes what the survivor is receiving. Uh, one important note here um, is to remember that between your own CPP and uh, the survivor's benefit, it can never be greater than the individual maximum. So we saw a few slides ago, the individual maximum was about $1,200. It would never be bigger than 1200. So if you had a couple where they both were getting the maximum and one passed away, it's not gonna go to $2,400. It's gonna remain at the $1,200 and change. So as I say, I guess the point to take away from there is uh, expected to live a long time, maybe wait, shorten life expectancy, maybe start. And there is certainly no tie between spouses having to start at the same time. Right. Right. Okay. Uh, now, now we kind of get into the, the tax part of it. One thing um, that David does is tries to levelize someone's total lifetime taxes. So if someone has a really good pension, they got a lot of taxable income. If they have a really large RSP, that's going to become a RIF one day, it's going to be taxable when it comes out. So sometimes it makes sense maybe to start things a little bit earlier so that you have a, a, a level of income that maybe could drop your marge, your top marginal tax rate down a little bit and hence pay more tax over your lifetime. And really this, again, uh, it is different for everybody, but you know, David has software and things or applications that can kind of do this math. Should I start now? Should I wait? And really what the software can do is spit out, um, if you start now, you can have, say, $5,000 a month after tax income and retirement. If you wait, maybe you're only going to have, you know, $4,900 because you're paying extra taxes. Uh, so, it, it again, I, I, I'm sorry, David, if I sound really vague, but no. it's, this was really at the personal level where you make these determinations. Um, and I kind of leave it at that, but try to think about your tax position in the future as well. Because $1,400 is going to pay a lot, attract a lot more tax than $1,000. And I, well, one of the things that I try to say, well, I, I, it's not that I try to, I do say, but <laughs> the question is, um, the, the, the earlier you start thinking about this, it, the better your outcome is going to be. Mm -hmm. I, I'll give you a, an example of this, and that was two teachers um, married to one another, both earning their top end $95,000 a year, both uh, receiving in um, income. Mm -hmm. and they said, we have this extra money. And when I came to them, they were putting it in an RSP. And I said, you know, why are you doing that? And I know very well that because they just didn't know any better. Like, what else am I supposed to put the money in? Mm -hmm. And and I said, well, you're just adding to your taxable income because you're going to have these really great pensions when you retire. And then you're going to have this RIF payment on top of that. This is going to be a lot of tax you're going to be paying. So maybe we should consider a different way to invest. And so we, I got to them early enough before they were 40. They were, I think they were 39. Um, and um, and we started doing financial planning so that when they do and you can actually show them the difference of here's what you're doing move that forward in, in future and say this is what the outcome would be if you continue to do this mm -hmm. and here's the change that we propose and see what that looks like against what they were doing already you can yeah. see the advantage right away yeah and a, you know a couple like that I, i'm in total agreement they should probably be contributing to their tfsa's first yeah. Uh, and that way they'll have tax-free income in retirement, which is, you know, notwithstanding tax-free, it, it doesn't attract the OAS clawback. It doesn't attract any other benefits that they may be receiving that are income tested. Uh, so you're right. And I, as you, you know, you do these uh, calculations, it's nice to see it, I think, in black and white rather than just, I think it would be better if we did this, or I think yeah. it would be better if we did that. If we obviously you you and I can use the same application for doing this. It'll just show it. And there's no ambiguity about the decision. Yeah. We're not talking off the top of our heads. No, we're, no. We're black and white on the paper. Yeah. Dig in. Yeah. So the fourth bullet there is kind of combined as we were just talking with uh, the pension uh, point there. 
a very large RSP is going to at one day sooner or later has to be converted into a RIF and that has to be done by the end of the year someone turns 71 and then the following year they have to start taking income out whether they need it or not and that amount is about uh, not about it's exactly 5.28 percent of the opening value for that year so if someone had and I'll just do this exaggerate a little bit, but if someone had a million dollars in their RSP and it converted to a RIF, they are required to take out $52,800 in their 72nd year, whether they need the money or not. That goes straight into income. Um, one of the good news is that get, you can split it with a spouse if, uh, if that's the situation, but that's money that may not be needed. That person might just be filling up their bank account or using some of the money to fill up their TFSA or, or, or the like. So really big ta future taxable income may be a reason to start your CPP earlier. Do you, do you um, suggest or, or recommend this idea of when someone retires with a, a large RSP uh, balance, say $800,000, okay? Mm -hmm. And um, they don't need all that money. They need part of it, but not all of it. Do you suggest having splitting the RSP into two separate accounts and riffing one and leaving the other one to age 71? Yes, you most definitely could. Um, and there's another little wrinkle in the tax act that can help people out and it's called the pension tax credit. So you can get uh, for the first $2,000 of pension income that someone receives uh, age 65 and later, um, there is a tax credit for that, which in Ontario, and I'm about to put a star next to this one somehow, but I believe it's about a $400 tax credit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So then that, what, that's what I would call the mini RIF strategy where you move some money over, as you say, split the RSP up, start income at 65 to 71 from that one half or whatever proportion of the RSP, get the pension tax credit. It's also splittable that income and uh, a spouse could also use the pension tax credit on that split income. So it, setting up this so-called mini RIF is, is a good idea. I suggest it to a lot of people. And the last bullet, which you've kind of been talking about through all of these is, uh, is the income splitting that's available for people 65 and over for pension income, annuity income, RIFs, lifts, uh, and so on. That is splittable with a spouse, which is very handy because you can, if there's a hundred thousand dollars of income in the household and it was all qualified for income splitting, then each spouse would report 50,000. And obviously the tax on 50, two times the tax on 50 is a lot less than one times the tax on a hundred thousand dollars. So that's something to contemplate as well. Um, and all of this comes out, you know, there's certainly the software we use does all these sorts of calculations. So that's an, yet another thing to consider. Um, but the big ones for me are um, longevity is probably the big one for me and taxes. Those are the things to think about the most. Let's set it up in a way that I will have the highest after-tax income for the longest. Is, and I know that's, a, that's a bit more complicated solution than question, but that's probably the way to, to think about it. So longevity then, that really means you're having a, a, a frank conversation with clients that say, tell me about um, longevity in your family. Are your parents still living? Are your grandparents yeah. still living? Is there a history of, of people dying at younger ages in your family or living mm -hmm. to older ages? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and one thing to contemplate too is that there is a survivor's benefit for CPP, but there isn't one for OAS. Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, and when something unfortunate happens and someone becomes a widow or a widower, that $600 a month then stops. Yeah. So you need to kind of, if there's a, maybe a large age gap between in a, with a couple or one is in great health and one perhaps isn't in such great health, that's something to contemplate as well. Yeah. And so here's just some examples that I'd used earlier in the talk. Uh, starting CPP earlier, if uh, someone had qualified for $1,000 a month, they started at 60. As a reminder, they get $640. And if they had waited till 70, they would get $1,420. That's a huge difference. It's a big gap. Yeah, it's a big gap. And I know this is a little hard to, to figure out here, but 
kind of look at where all the lines are crossing. And so what I did was just a little quick chart here to see about how many years after age 65 do the lines cross. And they cross around the, what would you say? They start crossing at the 12th year, which would be age 77. And then maybe as far out as the 22nd year, which would be about age 87. So if you just want to purely add up the payments, and say, when do the lines cross based on uh, how long I think I'm going to live? <laughs> that kind of will give you an idea when to start. You know that joke about the uh, the difference between a good actuary and a bad actuary. You know, uh, a good one can tell you, or a bad one will tell you how many people are going to pass away, and a good one will tell you who. So <laughs> <laughs> that's true. <laughs> But that's really what, what, and I know that talking about mortality is not a comfortable subject, but as David was saying, if you look around the, your family, aunts and uncles and parents and uh, siblings, if everyone is just, you know, super active at 80 and 85 and things, uh, that might be a reason to wait and yeah. start later. And what about this issue? I know this is a little off, well, it's, 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 a, it's an important subject, and that is as people age, People um, have cognitive um, issues, mm -hmm. and this idea of making sure that you've decided prior to, uh, we'll say, let's yeah. say, if you if you elect to defer, let's say, but you can always say, I want to start taking it, or you have to defer until at a certain age, or it's not like you're saying to revenue, like I'm playing the person who says, I don't know anything about CPP, I'm not going to take it right now. But then they're 66 and they change their mind. Oh, that's yeah. perfectly okay. Just notify the government that you want to start. And there is actually a little wrinkle in the rules that if someone starts and decides they shouldn't have started, like perhaps they continue to work or something, they can actually stop it within 11 months of starting it, pay it back, and then wait and start so it in the future. So it's a very good idea that spouses have power of attorneys on one another for financial oh, yes. decisions. Because yeah. this timeline, yeah. they may not be able to make those decisions. Most definitely. I think, well, we do it all the time. It's probably on the, might be the second question on a fact finder is, do you have a power of attorney and a will? Right. Uh, absolutely. Because you will find out the importance of them if you don't have one. <laughs> yeah, exactly. exactly. Yeah. Um, so just as a, uh, to sort of recap a little bit, uh, expect larger tax bills later in life, maybe a reason to start earlier, and that would be someone with a big RSP or a very rich pension. But if you, people expect their net income to drop um, in retirement uh, or have lower tax bills for forever, for whatever reasons, they may want to start later to try to, as I said, we're not really averaging the taxes. We're just trying to make the taxes that someone pays over the lifetime the least amount. And right. if you prepay some by taking money early, that may be beneficial in the future because the RSP may be a bit smaller and hence less minimums required. So it's all a bit of a balancing act. And um, I think the important thing to point out here too is that once uh, a decision is made or the first decision is made, it's, it's uh, apart from CPP and starting, uh, all your other financial planning, all that can be sort of massaged and changed. And maybe we will take some this year, maybe we won't. Um, a little bit extra so i don't want people to think that once the plan is set it's sort of cast in stone there are some things that are immovable like you know once you get deep into starting cpp you can't stop that or stop the oas but what's coming out of your RIF and what's going into your tfsa and your source of income in retirement all that could, those dials can all be turned uh yes and uh, back to sort of the the vagary or the, the, the no specific answer. Um, <laughs> what some advisors uh, will do if it makes sense is they'll say, why don't you start early even though you don't need the income and we'll use that money to fill up your TFSA. And in my example, if $640 was coming in, if someone could keep $500 of that after tax and they did that every month, there's your $6,000 TFSA contribution for the year. So so let's examine um, a scenario where you have a couple and one spouse is at an age where they can retire. You know, for instance, public service workers, mm -hmm. teachers, that magic 
number 85 or 90, I think whatever yeah. they're using yeah. to calculate their retirement eligibility. And they're in their mid fifties. They're not quite 60. So they have four or five years before they could be eligible to take their CPP. Mm -hmm. How does that affect? I mean, it's great for them. They get, they, they say we retired at such a young age, but they don't have the, the CPP. How does that affect the calculation and not working uh, a number of years before they're turning 65? Yeah, if you think of it just like a company pension plan and someone was gonna, they just stopped contributing to the company pension plan, obviously their benefit is gonna be less because right. they, they, they built up a smaller pool of money uh, because they've stopped contributing uh, before sort of the age 60 or whatever the case may be. So the CPP benefit will just be reduced proportionally. Um, and is so there really, this is on the last few years of retirement versus the first few years of, of paying into the plan? It's not really weighted that way. Um, I think in a, indirectly it is because uh, there's this thing uh, called the yearly maximum pensionable earnings, the YMPE. And 2021, I believe it's around $59,000 and it gets indexed. So last year, let's say it was 58 and the year before that it was 56, whatever the case may be. So you are allowed to contribute more and more and more to the plan just because this limit is going up. So it, in, a, I guess I, in a mathematical sense, David, you're right that the later deposits have more impact because they can be bigger. Right. So the person who retires at age 55 has five years before age 60 that those five years are not part of the calculation exactly the CPP payment yeah so and let's for really arguments say, yeah sorry to interrupt it but if arguments sake the ympe is sixty thousand dollars that's six thousand dollars a year between employer and employee that would go into the plan so if they retire five years early that's thirty thousand dollars that never makes it into their cpp bucket right exactly that makes sense you know, I appreciate um, you taking the time to to come on live today. Oh, it's my pleasure. This is a subject that a lot of people um, ask me about when uh, client or non-client. They're just like, "Should I take my CPP?" And you smile, you know, when you say, "Well, that depends." And that's not <laughs> an answer that somebody somebody just says, "I just want the answer." And the, and the question is kind of vague. It's like, "Well, tell me about your family." Um, yeah. Do they, do they um, live long ages? So it, all of a sudden you start getting into non-financial discussions with clients or people in general talking about longevity, talking about, well, how did you, uh, do you have any money saved up outside of your RSP? Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of that has to do with the answer to this whole thing about when should I take my CPP is tell me about your planning. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and that, uh, I know for obviously this is the way you, you work with your clients, David, but that way if you have the, the big picture, like all the information, you can make a very educated decision about when to start it. But with just snippets of information, it's difficult to make, make the right decision or the you right see, recommendation. I mean, I think that's a probably a better word. You see, you know, in our business, in the years we've been in business, you see so many different ways people have saved or they'll call it saving for retirement. Um, I've, I've seen people who aggressively pay down their mortgage and their home, but have very small RSP mm -hmm. uh, balances and it's time to retire. And they didn't have the benefit of having an advisor talk to them and show them, you know, what's going to happen, but they're now faced with the decision of they can't live in the home that they paid down aggressively because they don't have enough money to retire on. Yeah. Yeah. And they have to take their CVP early. Um, and it's really not enough money and they end up having to do, you know, reverse mortgages or sell their homes. And so to answer these questions, it's really about getting started as soon as possible, planning with your advisor, making yeah. sure that it's all yeah. in paper. Yeah, most definitely. And, uh, the other thing to contemplate too, is that people will spend, like, like we kind of joke about this, but we, when someone initially retires, we call it the go phase. And then maybe the, that's the first 10 to 15 years. Then there's the slow go phase where people are starting to maybe not 
travel as much and leisure activities are not as frequent. And then there's the no-go age where, for whatever reasons, not interested in traveling anymore, uh, not golfing anymore, whatever the, the, those matters would be. I got to think about kind of the timing of the expenses as well. It's not like it's going to be a level each month. I need five thousand dollars. Like I may need ten thousand dollars a month at the beginning, and then eight, and then maybe I need ten again because I have to go into, uh, you know, retirement home or assisted living or something. And right. uh, the reason I just bring that up um, is that uh, if someone does go to a retirement home or the like. They're not cheap. And having that $1,400 a month CPP for when you're 85 plus or 90 plus, that could go a long way towards the cost of uh, assisted living. Well, you know, it's a great point because when um, someone says, I'm going to retire at age 65, statistically speaking, more than half the population does not retire in the year they thought they were. It's about 52, 53% of people mm -hmm. actually retire early. Well, not retire, stop working yeah. because of either their own medical condition or they have to care for a spouse that it has a medical condition. Mm -hmm. that it, so that this idea of planning and having money outside of your RSP um, is very important because access to cash is going to be really important yes. in this time, right? Yeah, you don't want to use pre-tax like, or after-tax dollars from an RSP for those things because that can get very, very expensive. And then very, very dangerous for you. You're gonna yeah. expire all of your retirement assets long. Yes. Before. Yeah. 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 Most well, definitely. It's. I appreciate your time, Scott. This is a very informative session on CPP. Great. When to take it? I look forward to maybe another topic with you again when we uh, um, go certainly into the summer. Have a have a great week, and I look forward to talking with you again. Okay. Thanks, David. My take pleasure. care.